am in Albuquerque, New Mexico at the National Museum of Nuclear Science and History. And uh, I can't claim to be an expert on this topic, so I have brought America's next Bob Oppenheimer, my friend Dylan, so uh, he's gonna help me figure out what this stuff is, but this museum is supposed to be really cool. Let's go check it out. Wait, what atom is that? I believe that is a stable beryllium atom. Precisely what I thought, wow. The museum has quite a few outdoor displays. Most are in a fenced off nuclear scrapyard area that we'll go into later. But by the road, there is an authentic Redstone missile. The Redstones were the first ballistic nuclear missiles developed in the early 1950s. This museum originally opened in 1969 as the Sandia Atomic Museum and it has moved a few times over its 50 year history. This facility is relatively new, and it's very nice. The grounds are scattered with these nuclear warhead pylons. Here are some Terrier missiles on a launcher. These were the first surface to air missiles that could be launched from ships. Several Navy vessels had these during the 60s. Now let's head into the National Museum of Nuclear Science and History. At the entrance, there is a periodic table embedded into the floor. Here are the pioneers of the atom, various scientists who made important discoveries that led to nuclear science. The story of nuclear history truly begins during World War II with the Manhattan Project, which was in a sense initiated by Albert Einstein. His equation E equals mc squared made it theoretically possible to produce a nuclear bomb. Einstein realized this and wrote a letter to FDR, warning that the Nazis were looking into developing nuclear weapons, so the United States needed to do the same. Einstein had fled to the United States from Germany to escape from all of that. So the top secret Manhattan Project was established. One reason this museum is in New Mexico is because Los Alamos, New Mexico was a base of operations for the Manhattan Project. Here are some World War II artifacts from Japan, like a Japanese army officer's sword. There's also a Japanese helmet, and an original Japanese Type 96-1 aviation radio used in single seat airplanes. That's a Japanese Arasaka Type 99 rifle. Apparently as the war went on, they deteriorated in quality due to a shortage of parts. That's a later version of the same rifle, with its stock cut down. Here are some Nazi German relics, including a helmet and other interesting pieces of porcelain. There are mirrors reflecting the Nazi insignia on the bottom of these. There's a Carabiner 98K rifle, the standard issue rifle of the Germans throughout the war, and a bayonet. There's a Hitler Youth armband, and an Army Officer's Service dress cap. That's an entrenching spade. And there's a German field telephone. Along with a 1941 daybook made by a German coal company, and a German gas mask container. Here's a collection of instruments from Enrico Fermi's laboratory at the University of Chicago. He is one of the most important figures of early nuclear science. It was under his supervision that the first nuclear chain reaction in world history occurred in 1942. He later worked on the Manhattan Project at Los Alamos. This is a Lego replica of Chicago Pile No. 1, which contained the world's first controlled, self-sustaining nuclear chain reaction. It was composed of 500 tons of graphite blocks containing 50 tons of uranium, not Legos. This is pretty cool, an artistic recreation of a Los Alamos laboratory room at the moment when they created the Trandy Bomb, originally called the Gadget, when human beings first created a practical device powered by nuclear fission. All of this stuff is supposed to be a criticality experiment, an attempt to figure out how much plutonium-239 could be packed into a bomb for maximum efficiency while still being safe to handle. A lot of these furnishings, instruments, and tools are original to the Los Alamos Scientific Laboratory. They were collected by an artist named Jim Sanborn, who created this. Here they are working on the Fat Man bombs, the one tested in southern New Mexico 
before one was dropped on Nagasaki, Japan. That is an assembly for determining the critical mass of a hydride cube. That is the bottom half of a disassembled physics package of the Trinity device. The engineering people, are we still use those? It's like my engineering class. We still write like, this is the same format. There's a sign for the scram procedure. The Los Alamos Bomb Project Design Lab was spearheaded by physics whiz J. Robert Oppenheimer, who successfully led the program and is considered as the father of the atomic bomb. This is a Norden M9 bomb site. These were the most accurate bomb sites of World War II, giving the U.S. Army Air Corps a huge advantage. Los Alamos was a top secret town during the Manhattan Project. Very few people except those who worked there knew about it. And during that time, Mike Mikovits photographed life there. So there is his camera and some other artifacts from Los Alamos. That's a Los Alamos resident state driver's license, although their name is listed as 224, and the address is Special List B, Santa Fe. There's a toy truck from the Los Alamos Youth Camp, and a super vinyl record that had a lot of music on it. I don't know if I've seen one with that much music on it. There's a classic radio set playing music of the times. Here's a display on Hal Bell, who worked at the K-25 lab in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. There is his Manhattan Project identification badge. This is a miniature replica of the Enola Gay, the B-25 superfortress that dropped the first atomic bomb on Hiroshima, Japan. A truly world-changing event. The scene depicted here is the loading of the little boy bomb. The real Enola Gay still exists. It's at the Udvar-Hazy Center of the National Air and Space Museum in Chantilly, Virginia. I have seen it in person. Of course, it was a big and consequential decision to initiate that sort of warfare. The new president, Harry Truman, who had no knowledge of the Manhattan Project before FDR died, was thrown into making that decision. This is a replication of the Little Boy atomic bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima on August 6, 1945, the first nuclear bomb used in warfare, resulting in about 135,000 casualties. And this is a full-scale replica of the Fat Man bomb, which was dropped on Nagasaki, Japan a few days later on August 9th of 1945, which resulted in about 64,000 casualties. This is a 1942 Packard limousine that was used to transport Manhattan Project scientists and military officers between Los Alamos and the train station in Lemine, New Mexico. It was also used to drive down for the Trinity test, the first atomic explosion that occurred in the White Sands area of southern New Mexico. Here is another Packard Clipper limousine that was used to transport the Manhattan Project scientists to Los Alamos. And that is the Trinity flag, the one that flew over the Trinity base camp during the test. However, the high winds in that area caused the damage, not the first atomic detonation in history. This is a full-scale replica of the Gadget, the world's first atomic device that was tested at the Trinity site. They called it the Gadget because they didn't want to use words like atomic or bomb for obvious reasons. It was an implosion-type bomb that basically did the same thing that the Fat Man bomb did when it was dropped just three weeks later. A 100-foot tall tower was built to hold the Gadget, These are samples of trinitite, a new mineral that resulted from that first atomic explosion in the desert sand. This is a seismograph that was used to record the ground shock waves of the Trinity test. These maps were used by the army for planning the invasion of the Japanese mainland. So, two atomic bombs were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, Japan, killing between 100 and 200,000 people, mostly civilians. But that drastic event finally persuaded Japan to surrender and end the unfathomably costly war. 
This is a tile fragment from a building that was near the epicenter of the explosion in Hiroshima. There's a license plate from Nagasaki that was clearly damaged by the bomb. There's a photo of a famous bomb damaged bicycle. World War II had finally ended, but the world was now changed. And it was scary going into the future with this kind of technology. As it turned out, an arms race to create lots of bigger and deadlier bombs ensued throughout the Cold War. So this section of the museum is going to have a lot of nukes. That's nice. The threat of nuclear proliferation was definitely on the minds of Americans in the post-war era. There were constant duck and cover drills at school, like that was going to do anything. Fallout shelters were also being constructed all over the place for protection against nuclear attacks and fallout. That involved the hoarding of food and supplies. This is a Lance Mobile short range ballistic missile. These were designed to operate in any climate. There's a Civil Defense Corps helmet from World War II. During the war, they were already preparing for the event in which Germany beat them to successful ballistic missiles. During the 50s, Civil Defense created lots of literature for the public about how to survive an H-bomb and its fallout. Civil Defense was a top priority of the Kennedy administration. He encouraged the construction of public shelters and for private individuals to build their own in their backyards. All of that became less of a priority during the 70s. But there was increased interest during the Reagan years, and Civil Defense evolved into FEMA and DHS later on. There's a Soviet gas mask. These were issued to people during the 1970s. There is a mad nuclear missile hanging from the ceiling. This is a special atomic demolition munition, a package warhead developed by the Navy during the 60s. In the event they would be used, Mariners would land and plant it, set a timer, then swim back out to sea for retrieval before the nuclear explosion. This is a Minuteman Mark V re-entry vehicle. It is very charred because this one was actually sent to space and had to re-enter Earth's atmosphere. The Honest John was the first nuclear tip rocket deployed by the US Army in the mid-1950s. It's loaded up on a launcher. The big missile up there is the Trident, a ballistic missile that would be launched from a submarine. They were first developed in 1979 and were ready to be fired by Ohio-class nuclear-powered submarines. This is a miniature replica of the USS Ohio, the lead vessel carrying Trident missiles. The Ohio class of submarines were the largest type ever constructed by the US Navy. Here are examples of payloads. The missile tips where the payloads would be held. Here are some examples of nuclear bombs from the 50s, like the Mark 8. There are a lot of nukes here. Just think, this exhibit could have destroyed the world over. These nukes were involved in some sort of accident. Nuclear weapon accidents are called broken arrows, and it's surprising how many serious accidents have happened like that time when a nuclear bomb was accidentally dropped on South Carolina. This is a WE-177 bomb developed by the British during the Cold War. Here are some chunks of the Berlin Wall, another symbol of the Cold War. Here are some vintage, specially designed computer parts from silo facilities.
Here's an interactive display where we can control time during a nuclear test. Wouldn't you want to experience some? <laughs> yeah, sure, why not? <laughs> Ships into like. Oh, there goes your radar. Yeah. This is a B 83 strategic nuclear gravity bomb, which could free fall or had a parachute just in case. And this is an earlier B 61 missile. One of the first with a built-in parachute pack. How fun. Here's a display about the Cuban Missile Crisis. One of the closest instances to all-out nuclear war, and hopefully it will remain that way. This is a short-range attack missile that could be launched from B-52s. These could also reverse course 180 degrees. The next exhibit is about atomic pop culture. There's a sign for the National Atomic Museum, which was the name of this museum for a long time, not to be confused with the National Atomic Testing Museum in Las Vegas. Arco, Idaho was the first city in the world to be lit by atomic power. I have been there multiple times. That is a small replication of an iconic sign on Arco's town hall. The Boy Scouts had some nuclear connections. They encouraged education about these topics and offered an atomic energy merit badge. Here are some nuclear inspired toys, like Homer Simpson dressed for work at the nuclear plant, and Jimmy Neutron. This is a nuclear themed race car. No, it was not nuclear powered, but it was designed to bring attention to nuclear clean air energy. There's a vintage uranium and mineral map of the Southwest. Here are some anti nuclear bomb shirts. This is a display about the NS Savannah, the world's first nuclear powered cargo and passenger merchant ship built in the late 1950s. That is an electrical officer's cap from the Savannah. This is the key for stateroom number one on the NS Savannah. There's an ashtray created by the company that operated the Savannah, along with a Savannah uniform badge. And this is a dinner menu from the Savannah's dining room on October 22, 1964. Lionel made a series of atomic themed model trains back in the day. There's one carrying an atomic cannon. There's a missile on that train car. That one is carrying some atomic waste. Toy atomic reactors were also made in the 50s. Here is an original DeLorean. Of course made famous as a time machine in Back to the Future for time travel, which in the first movie was fueled with plutonium by a nuclear reactor, or the flux capacitor. There's a replica of it there. Nuclear radiation accidents are prevalent in the origin stories of comic book characters. There's an issue of the Thing and She-Hulk reacting to a nuclear disaster, and one about Aquaman stopping a nuclear holocaust. This display is about the role of nuclear radiation in medicine. The interactive children's area is closed off right now, but there is a puppet of Albert Einstein. The next exhibit is the Energy Encounter. After seeing all those bombs and how this stuff may well be the end of humanity at some point, it's also nice to see that there is good potential for nuclear energy. This is a replica containment structure. Chernobyl didn't have a containment structure. So when the top came off the reactor, Everything oxidized, everything blew out of the building. If this was there, 
it may not have actually blew out of the actual building. Here is a miniature reactor and containment dome with some buttons to make it light up. Here is a miniature replica of the NS Savannah nuclear ship. We can light up the reactor below deck. EBR-1 near Arco, Idaho was the first electricity producing nuclear power plant in the world. I have been there and have a video tour of it. Used nuclear fuel can be recycled and made into new reactor fuel or other products, but it was suspended by President Carter and has never really continued since, but France and some other countries do it a lot. Here's a display about the use of energy in America, which for a long time has been mostly petroleum and natural gas. Nuclear electric power and renewable energy just makes up about 20%. Here's a placard explaining why energy isn't free. Sure, it is costly to produce and innovate, but dang, it can be expensive. There's also a display on solar energy here as well. I guess they want to support alternatives. Also, here's a wind tunnel for some reason. This display case contains various nuclear-themed souvenirs, including some from the NS Savannah, there is a souvenir lamp from the Three Mile Island nuclear plant in Pennsylvania, perhaps the most infamous here in America due to a partial reactor meltdown during the 70s. And there's a nuke worker bobblehead. I will say, there is an absence of Chernobyl in this museum. Uranium is crucial to nuclear fission, and there was lots of uranium mined right here in New Mexico. That uranium ashtray from the 50s is really cool, but probably unsafe as there are uranium ore pieces embedded around the Native American picture. Back during the 1950s, Grants, New Mexico on Route 66 was considered the uranium capital. There were major uranium mines in that region of western New Mexico, and here's a little replicated mine with a mine cart. So what's happening here? Well, they're supposed to go into the centri not, centripetal force. That's what's... Okay. So yeah, the centripetal force is pulling inwards with the opposing centrifugal, but... All right, how much U-235 is contained in raw, raw meat U-238? U is for uranium, of course. Got these uh, glowing marbles. What is it? You know, if you count it up, you get that. Oh my god, you're a genius. The Nazis were trying to develop atomic bombs, and one method they tried under Werner Heisenberg was the production of uranium cubes. And here is an authentic one created by the Nazis. That's actually kind of creepy. Heisenberg would also turn these uranium cubes into the liquid version, known as heavy water. There's some contained in those vials. That liquid form is very expensive to produce. Nuclear technology has a place in many fields such as medicine. That device is for gamma camera imaging. That's a 1950s gamma camera for finding gamma rays radiating off the human body. Clearly there are many other places nuclear science was crucial, like for x-rays. That's a 2000 volt x-ray tube. They also have a full exhibit featuring samples of radiation quackery from the early 20th century. Many quack doctors promoted radioactivity treatments and therapies for just about any illness with these bizarre instruments. This is a 1930s low voltage generator that supposedly treated all sorts of ailments, like sore muscles and joints. Soon after its discovery, radium was put into all sorts of products in the early 1900s, like water dispensers, here are some relics with appetite in them, including a dinosaur fossil. Here's an old bottle of healing pure radium water, 
from the Hotel Sequoia that used to stand in Claremore, Oklahoma. Radithor was a popular quack medicine until it killed a socialite in 1932. The Wall Street Journal reported on that, with a headline reading that radium water worked fine until his jaw came off. Here's another display full of everyday objects from back in the day, composed of some radium. There's some 1950s souvenir uranium jewelry from Moab, Utah, which was known as the uranium capital of the world. There's a 1948 Donald Duck watch containing radium, which was used in the luminous paint so that the clock face and hands were visible in the dark. There's a Revigator on the left, which added radon to drinking water, and a radium emanator filter jar on the right from the 30s. Uranium glass was even produced in the late 19th century, and it was very popular. Actually, it is still created today. I wonder how much radiation a visitor to this museum gets. Here are some nuclear war themed games from the 50s. There's an atom bomb perfume bottle from the 40s used by bombshells. And there's some antique atomic toy guns. Here's a cabinet full of various Geiger counters. There's a Geiger counter watch. Geiger counters can be loud and mildly annoying. There's also a radiation dosage estimator. We're going to max it out and see what it says. <laughs> it's on Mount Everest. Oh no. <laughs> While I was enjoying the quackery, Dr. Science is over here playing with the periodic table. It's a little game where you make compounds. In the gift shop, Einstein is helming a jeep. They have some dolls of Einstein and Rosie the Riveter. Visitors can also purchase some authentic pieces of Trinitite from the Trinity site. They also have a small bust of Dr. Oppenheimer for sale. So, those exhibits were great and very comprehensive, but there's plenty more big stuff outside. This is known as the Heritage Park. And there's some really cool stuff out here. This first airplane is an F-16 Fighting Falcon, also known as the Viper. It was used by the New Mexico Air Guard. The Land of Enchantments Air Guard are known as the Tacos, as labeled on the tail fin. There is also an awesome New Mexico style painted bird carrying bombs. I love that, that is awesome. This is a TA-7C Corsair II, nicknamed Sluff for short little ugly feller. These were used extensively in Vietnam. This is an F-105D Thunder Chief, and this particular one was based out of West Germany during the 1960s. Here's a Soviet Mikhail Yangurevich MIG-21 fish bed, the Soviet's first Mach 2 fighter, This is pretty cool, a full-scale replica of the 100-foot tall tower that was at the Trinity site used to dangle the gadget for the world's first ever nuclear detonation. There's another replica of the gadget set up just like it was on that fateful day in White Sands. The majority of the tower was vaporized. Of course, there are some more decommissioned nuclear missiles out here. What did you expect?
Now this is epic, an authentic B-29 Super Fortress. One of the most massive airplanes of its time, and the exact same type as the Enola Gay and Boxcar, the ones that dropped the bombs. There's another replica of the Fat Man bomb, placed right by where it was loaded, so you can see how big the bomb is compared to the Super Fortress. The museum's backyard is alone worth a visit. This is one of the coolest and most unique features of the museum. The Atomic Cannon. This big cannon from the 1950s was capable of firing a nuclear device long distance. This one, along with about 20 others, were stationed in Europe on the nuclear battlefield, ready to fire at the Soviets. This one is accurately portrayed on its two original transport trucks. This atomic cannon was mobile and ready to shoot and scoot. Actually, these things were apparently more dangerous to transport. During transport, the big heavy cannons would often slide off the pavement and even cause some bridges to collapse, and stuff like that killed several atomic cannon crew members over the years. This is really neat to see, I have never seen one of these before. This retro spaceship is actually a B-58 Hustler pod which contained a thermonuclear weapon and carried extra fuel for B-58 Hustler aircraft. Here's a Mark 17 nuclear bomb. This type was the largest ever deployed by the United States. This is a B-52 Strato Fortress, the next evolution of the Super Fortress. During the 50s and 60s, these Strato Fortresses were always ready to deliver nuclear warheads, but during and after Vietnam, their role changed to tactical non-nuclear bombing. Break it. I don't want to break it. It's so thin. Here's a Snark Intercontinental Cruise Missile. These were replaced by ICBMs. That's a Matador, the first guided missile ever deployed by the Air Force. This is a B-47E Stratojet, which could fly at subsonic speeds to deliver nukes without enemy interception. Here are some dissections of peacekeepers. This area is basically a nuke junkyard. Oh look, there's a cute bunny hopping amongst the nukes. How are you enjoying the Nuke Boneyard? This is super cool, I didn't expect it. It is, cool. yeah. To think, we could have destroyed the world with all of this. This one is known as the Thor Missile, developed early in the Cold War Missile Race. There's some rusty old warheads with the mighty Sandias in the background. Those are the remains of a Polaris A3. And finally, here is a rather unique relic. The conning tower of the USS James K. Polk. 
a nuclear submarine capable of launching nuclear missiles. She was in service from 1956 to 1999, and yes, was powered by a nuclear reactor. Wow, the National Museum of Nuclear Science and History is awesome! I am extremely impressed with this museum, and learned a lot about this very interesting yet unnerving topic. I'd highly recommend a visit if you're in the area. If you enjoyed this video, then please like it, share it, and subscribe to my channel. I have filmed tons of other videos on all sorts of unique museums, roadside attractions, historic sites, national parks, and more across the country, including some here in Albuquerque and across New Mexico. Thanks for watching.